should ask me. Hello, there we are. Yeah, absolutely. Here's this is here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Ronnie from the the Love Fruit Podcast, and I'm here with my guest today, Jill Swires. And let me tell you a little bit about Jill just before we we start. She worked in the catering industry for years. Uh, she's worked in Greece, South Africa, Portugal, Austria, Switzerland, France. Had a catering company in London as well. And she actually, for years, suffered from low energy levels, felt debilitated and was diagnosed as suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, hypo hypoglycemia, candida, and Raynaud's disease. And she started to believe that her condition could be potentially linked to diet, started going down the path of making changes there, um, ended up being qualified at Hippocrates Health Educator and, and become a Hippocrates Ambassador as well, which is a very well-known Raw Foods Institute. And she then has went on to help other people with that information and, and advice. So uh, I'm pleased to be speaking to you today, Jill. And is there anything else you'd like to say about yourself as an introduction? Well, I've been very fortunate to also work at Hippocrates Health Institute. I used to go out there every year staying with my friend Scott Sprouts um, and just going in voluntary to work. But to me, voluntary means work all day. Um, and so I worked with different departments with guests uh, who were staying there, you know, whether it's cancer, diabetes, you name it. And I gained, a, I always called it updating my training and it was the best thing I ever did. It helped so much with working with people outside in other countries, etc. So, you know. So could we maybe talk about what is... Uh... What was your start, really? Were you brought up on a healthy diet, on a conventional diet, or what was your background? Um, I don't know about healthy, but vegetables, I will say, were part of it. When I think about it, how they were cooked might be another story, but we had to eat them. And it was if you didn't finish them then, at the meal, then you have to have them eat later. Um, whether I like them or not, I'm not sure about that. But, you know, we all had that and overcooked cabbage at school and things like that. Um, but to be honest, I think it's so important. And um, we were being taught well as children, but didn't appreciate it at the time. Now, of course, it's one of the main things I push a lot. For sure. So uh, uh, did you have any health issues as, as you were growing up? I had things like bronchitis. Um, I used to get colds and things. But one thing we were taught, at least through myself, is that you still had to go to school even if you were unwell. And uh, the only thing was to come off uh, sport, have a letter to say you couldn't do sport because you were unwell. But apart from that, life had to go on. And I always joke now and say, well, of course, that shouldn't have happened because I'm lazy at times. <laughs> I encourage sport, don't worry, and yoga and things. But, you know, even I can be lazy. But, yes, I had health challenges, but life went on, and that's the way it is. So and that's changed. Where actually were you brought up? Originally in Surrey and Sussex. All oh, right, okay, okay. Yeah, and, um, and then things changed, so we ended up in the other side of Brighton. And... Uh, I was pushed away to school and um, and food was my addiction in those days. Right, right. <laughs> if I was, you know, if we'd had Sunday lunch, seconds and thirds, and I couldn't wait to get home because I was still hungry. I never understood why. Of course I do now and <laughs> it's, it's more balanced and the addiction will always be there like it is with smoking, drugs, alcohol, you name it. Uh, but if you're the right balance, it's fantastic. You know, I've got my greens here. Um, I don't just drink juice, but that's part of it. Uh -huh. And um, uh, yes, you know, onwards and upwards. I would say every year gets easier. Fantastic. So at, at, at what point did you 
start to make changes to your diet or realize that there might be something something wrong there? Good question. Right. I had my catering business in London and we had to move premises. Basically, they have to rent so much. And as the accountant said, it's not worth anything unless you own the property. And in the end, at the time, I had lumps and bumps in the front and various places. And I was very overweight. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to pack my bags and go to Portugal, sell the business, uh, which everybody was shocked at the time. I was shocked for about three years myself. That's called ego. And <laughs> it had a very good reputation and... You know, anyway, uh, it took it took me a while to get over the shock of selling it, but it was the best thing long term. It was a very and successful business then. It was, yes. And we, I was catering in Portugal anyway, so I continued for a bit there. And then gradually I thought, I'm just as exhausted. And then thought, right, I have to lose weight once and for all. Right. And so I was quite overweight. If I hadn't changed then, would I be here now or would I be so obese, like sadly so many people are these days? Um, you know, you just don't know how to cope. So I did food combining, not mixing carbohydrate and uh, proteins in those days and gradually gave up things and then became vegan. But it, I did a gradual process. And uh, I noticed how much better I was when I wasn't eating meat, I wasn't getting angry or tetchy, um, et cetera. And so, um, and it made a big difference, but of course I wasn't getting advice at the time. So I was still thinking about food just as much. And then I was very fortunate to, what was I doing? Got involved with aloe vera juice I'm an Australian company in those days, but they pulled out of Europe, so I don't use them now. I support what's local and or who brought stuff in. And then um, I was very fortunate to get involved with nutrition and hear Hippocrates Health Institute speaking in London. And food was the subject that day, but of course it's not just food, there's a whole circle. But in the end, I was fortunate about two or three years later to be able to go out there and um, as a paying guest, then go as a student. And it's been onwards and upwards ever since. That's brilliant. And you mentioned that you started off with some food combining and you, you, you initially you were trying to lose some weight. And what was the initial influences there? Did you find books? Was there a person that you were helping with or get help from? Or how did it go? How did it work? Yes, the book I was following. Oh, so well known. My brain's gone. Um, food combining with um, Doris. Hey, Doris. Oh, my. I can't believe I've forgotten the name. I know it's here somewhere. Um, anyway, I followed that, i.e. not mixing meat and uh, not mixing carbohydrates and protein. So you wouldn't have potatoes with your meat if you were eating meat. Uh -huh. You wouldn't have bread and cheese together. You, OK, <laughs> I'm not doing any of that and I never liked cheese. But as somebody said at the yoga center in Portugal, have the bread, have the cheese, out go the hips. <laughs> you know, and she was brilliant and um <laughs> but it's true it's you it makes it too difficult on um digesting it and breaking it down right and so i did that but of course i was doing it very very well but not getting proper advice mm -hmm. and um but that's fine sometimes we have to learn the difficult way and then, of course, once I did get to Hippocrates and learned about all the green vegetables and the sprouts, sunflower, pea green, wheatgrass, you name it, it it definitely changed my life. But um, sometimes we have to go through experience, and that's what it was for me. And uh, even when I did go and try and get advice here in the UK, food in those days was not... There wasn't much experience with it. Now it's probably a bit more confusing, but in between we've had some really fantastic 
knowledgeable people around and uh, mm -hmm. uh you know so what was was the talk in london with hippocrates was that the first exposure to the raw food idea or had you i mean even how did you go vegan how did that all happen was it all before that um i'd start no i think i was building up to that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'd already started yes and then it happened to be uh, at a um, nutrition college and uh, the talk that day uh, was on um, uh, uh, food. I think I must have seen it sitting there and I'm thinking, oh, I must go. He's talking about food. And um, of course, at the time, I thought it was only food. And uh, when I said I'd like to come out and work and do things and whatever, I assumed, you know, oh, I'd get a job working with food. Um, but then I realized it was a little different and, it, you know, it did change my life. But then um, when I got out there, it was a big difference. But it, it was through a talk. It was Brian Clement who was speaking and um, I didn't I, I wasn't I was at the time doing events with aloe vera juice at the time. And I know I never went to the evening event. I think in those days, when you look back, that you know, there were a lot of words one didn't like, you know, the word hippie or um, holistic or going back in the 90s, early 90s. And um, and then someone said to me the other day, but you're hippie or the other month, you know, you're hippie. You're, you've become one of those, you know, so I said, yes, I agree. <laughs> and the word holistic is part of my whole teaching. So. It, it's just the way things were and so uh, you mentioned yeah. you mentioned some aloe vera juice was that something that before you got into Hippocrates and all that you you were involved in uh, I guess drinking aloe vera juice <laughs> and... well I I um at the time um I was living with a partner Peter and I uh in those days I was drinking alcohol but I, I don't anymore um, I was getting the hangover now, not tomorrow, and that just ruined it. So, <laughs> but just prior to that, I wasn't paying the out for the alcohol, and so I, I thought, okay, well, I can afford to do the aloe vera, and it was uh, I'd seen in a magazine, it was liquid, uh -huh. and I thought, oh, good, it's not tab tablets. So I started taking it, and then I drank quite a lot per month. And it made such a difference. Had I really got into things like wheatgrass, et cetera, wheatgrass juice and greens, that would have been even quicker. But, you know, it's all experience. And so that's what changed my life. The company was Australian and they um, used to give us nutrition trainings, which was wonderful. They were fantastic. I think they were the best. I think they are the best. But, you know, as I say, I support what, other people that bring stuff into the country you know I'm not going to wait for shipping to come in you know we all have to pay tax on things but that's not the issue it's more other people are doing a lot of hard work bringing stuff in so I must support yeah. whatever's here I and think there's so. other companies you know there's good companies I think that's interesting Sorry? I think it's interesting what you're saying there that this company although there were uh, distributing aloe vera juice they were actually giving nutritional trainings that's quite that's quite interesting that was fantastic and we used to go down they were based out of london and we were so fortunate and met some interesting people who were very uh keen on getting out there who knew how to you know your sponsor or whoever signed you up and it was fantastic i'm not so brilliant at uh I always joke and say, I'm not so brilliant at making the money, but I'm good at spreading the word. <laughs> you know, if I think something's good, that's fine. If something's bad, I'm not going to talk about it. Right. You know, because we all think differently. Uh -huh. But um, if it, it, and it was, it was brilliant. So, you know, it's, uh, I even brought loads of out of date stuff uh, at the end before they left. And I drank it all and I'm still here to tell the tale. You know. <laughs> yeah so it's 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 quite interesting you know there's been a lot of um uh 
companies maybe like like I I always personally tend to think that just having drink eating the fresh fruits and vegetables and stuff is the best thing. But it's interesting to me that that a lot of companies that do things like even selling supplements or certain products that part of what they do on top is what you're saying adding in trainings and nutritional information and weight loss information and and stuff like that that a lot of people wouldn't maybe get other places and they're kind of maybe attracted in by the juice but there's all this other stuff they get given as a as a part of it i suppose yes it's well it's i mean you can't live on supplements alone and not all are good unfortunately um that's they say we have a supplement sewage mountain somewhere um <laughs> because uh there are various books out there about what's good and what's bad and all the rest of it but um i still do drink aloe vera juice have my green vegetable protein juices if i haven't got what we originally were taught to put in it so i replace it other things um to me it's medicine if you don't like the taste it's medicine and then gradually your taste buds change mm -hmm. and uh um it becomes much easier you know um i prefer it without i prefer it without the fruit um i remember going somewhere it was just, they're not with us in london anymore but they i went there for a have lunch and i ordered a green juice but i said no apple at the time and when it came, I said, oh, there's an apple in it. I could taste it. It was too sweet for me, believe it or not. And uh, they said, no, no, we didn't. And, of course, they hadn't washed out the juicer. Oh, wow. And so the flavour was still there. I still, you know, so it's, it's that. But that doesn't mean, you know, I'm that fussy the whole time. It was just at the time. But, um, and, of course, green foods are oxygenated. So it puts oxygen into the body, there's all that. And if we could have fruit picked direct from the tree, then that is real fruit, as I call it. Well, but why, of course, it, yeah. Why is why would that be limited to fruit? What about why couldn't the other? Would you not say that about other foods as well? Oh yes, if we could have everything fresh. I mean, I support farmers markets. London Farmers Markets or Farmers Markets UK, um, where they don't actually have to have the organic certificate, but they have to be part of an association. Uh -huh. And in Portugal, there are parts of, um, well, I know a very good company that I've been buying off them for years, and they had to have the organic certificate. Um, but that every rule is different in every country. Um, but um, so I support the farmers markets here and I always joke and say if it's raining I'll be there even more so because you've had to come such a long way and then if no one turns up it's so unfair but um, uh, so yes if we could have so most of the stuff you get in the farmers markets officially is in season yes there's one or two places that are growing things out of season um people never understand like cucumbers you know there's a season for that but if we have them now they are very expensive because they're out of season or they brought them in from another country but the farmers markets have to be grown within 125 uk miles mm -hmm. um wherever they've come from so you know so let's get back to your story and you went to this Hippocrates talk in London and up to that point were you already vegan at that point? I think I'd become be vegan by then. Mm -hmm. Did you notice any changes by going vegan? Um, I did at the time other than I hadn't got the balance of food mm -hmm. which of course I didn't really understand at the time but what I noticed as I said earlier any form of meat whether it was fish, meat, red meat, you name it. I noticed when I wasn't eating it, when I stopped eating, I stopped eating it. Let's say I, I stopped it because, right, no meat for January. And then I noticed I was much calmer. I wasn't getting so angry. Mm -hmm. 
or answering back so much. Mm-hmm. And or, you know, like nowadays, I miss the bus and I go, I could have left earlier instead of blaming the bus driver, as everyone does. Um, <laughs> you'd be amazed how angry people get. But um, so then um, I uh, and then I was giving other things up. I think I gave up fish last mm-hmm. in saying that that's probably the one we should give up first. But in saying, you know, it just depends where you get it from. But um, and then I noticed um, and then gradually I was just changing and giving things up. And um, I used to be addicted to eggs, which, of course, is lack of protein at time, uh, many times. And um, I thought I haven't had eggs for ages. I'd even go and buy a box and then it sat in the fridge and never got used. Oh, wow. So my, my addiction from eggs went away. You know, and um, so things changed dramatically. Um, so I, I would say I did it over eight years. Um, and I didn't, you see, people say, oh, it's so difficult. You go into a restaurant now and people, they haven't got vegan and they don't like the fact you're vegan. And this, well, I didn't find it difficult in those days. And that was far less. But I just <laughs> look at them. I just went in one when we decided to go and eat someone who was a student with me at, in London and um, doing naturopathic nutrition and we went down and I just said oh I'll have this and this but actually if you talk to the chef I said they're all artists and just he'll probably raise his eyebrows and say oh no but I said could I have a b and c and da, da, da. well what came out I always remember it's years ago it was lovely yeah He had no complaints at all, you know. So I don't think you can blame the chefs, but give them a compliment first and they'll be happy. It's just that many chefs have to do exactly as their job tells them. Sure. You know, and I respect that too. So the how did you end up at the Hippocrates talk? Where where was it? And do you remember the subject or anything? Well, I seem to remember the subject was food, but I can't remember the rest of the title. Uh, it was to be, it might have said living foods. or, But it was to, at the time, it was at the uh, Patrick Wolford, Holford's place that was in Putney at the time. And I went there for the talk because it was only down the road. It's not there anymore. I'm not sure if he owns it anymore, but it's it's um, Richmond way. But he, I went there, and there was a group of us being afternoon, not so many people. But I think we've all met outside since. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a lovely, interesting talk, and the fact it was food, my addiction, of course. Um, it was uh, it was very interesting, but I didn't think I'd ever get to Hippocrates because it seemed so expensive. Mind you, in those days, rate of exchange was like three to, three to dollars to the pound. You didn't appreciate it at the time, but gosh, when you look back, you do. <laughs> but um, I couldn't have gone, but then I was fortunate to have been left some money soon after, well, about three years later, and I put it to good use, and I went over there. And uh, as I say, you know, the rate of exchange was fantastic. Uh, not like today and um, that's when I ended up going there I did the three weeks and then went back and did the full Hippocrates health educator course Mm -hmm. and uh, then I was I went off to Chile to stay with friends came back a bit earlier for various reasons and went to Hippocrates and said can I do some voluntary work and they probably thought I was going to lick a few envelopes, get my free lunch, and I won't swear, and go off. And no, no, to me, I came in first thing in the morning. I stayed with friends down the road in those days, other friends, and um, just came in every day, worked every day, left about 10 and arrived at 6, left about 10, and all I wanted was my food. Of course, nowadays, up and, well, I, up until lockdown, I was out there every year for a few weeks, gave talks, did the whole thing, worked in the kitchens. The food, of course, becomes less important because it's not so difficult to prepare and all that. But at the beginning, you think, 
God, I need the food. Um, and it all, it's, it's, it changed my life. You know, we're all very glad we went there, anyone that has been, because it was a great start, to be honest, to becoming vegan, to understanding the healthier side. Mm -hmm. Just because it's vegan doesn't mean it's healthy. Those are my words. Um, uh, because I see what people eat. And one person who was so sick met here who had cancer and she was introduced to me, I think actually through Brian, um, when he was giving a talk somewhere. And I said, well, the one thing you've got to come off is the raw dessert. <gasps> but they're raw, they're healthy. Poor thing. And uh, but a friend of hers was there and said, that's true. You know, because sugar's feeding the problem. But you've got to get the right balance. Just because it's raw doesn't mean it's healthy. It's getting the right. If it's gourmet, it can be delicious. We all know that. But if we're eating the heavy duty stuff too much, then it's difficult for the body to break it down. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you don't treat yourself occasionally. <laughs> so what did you learn with your first visit to Hippocrates? Well, you learned about the green protein juices. You learned about the uh, sprouts as in sun, wheatgrass juice. Um, wheatgrass juice, uh, and then you grew about the learning of growing of sprouts as in sunflower, pea green, you name it. Um, you know, for people who don't understand that, then the alfalfas of this world, uh, but the whole variety variety and how they've got different forms of protein how you know people talk about having legumes as in chickpeas and um bagonzo beans or um oh, uh, lentils um etc but once they become germinated they become easier on the digestion they come become a pre-digested food and whereas often when we have some delicious Asian foods um, with lentils, et cetera, there's a, you, you get a lot of gas or a lot of, um, you know, excuse the language, farting. And um, it, one never understood why. But uh, it, once you germinate and the body gets used to it and improves the digestion, then it becomes easier to eat. Chickpeas or cabonzos take longer mm -hmm. to digest. As delicious, they're much better once they've germinated. I have none to show today. I kept thinking I was speaking to you next week. And I thought, oh, good, I'll have a load of sprouts. But then I I just put the date in and I thought, oh, you've done it now. Leave it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or at least I said that to myself this morning. Um, and, um, and so... We learned an awful lot through that. That really did help us, I think. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment, you know, I mix with a lot of different communities. Uh, as I say, I'm South London uh, with a lovely group from Harrow and I go, I'm a lighter shade of pale. And uh, we always teach, we're on groups together. Um, and, you know, I know they eat a lot of beans and things, but they don't germinate it. And so I'm, you know, we're going to be doing workshops together and so then I can show it to them. And uh, it does make a difference. It's understanding herbs as well. Many vegetables are herbs. Uh, but depending which herbs, you know, you wouldn't overdo the garlic. Yes, we need garlic. But I've learned not to overdo it, i.e. in my juice. I did it once. Oh, did my heart beat? And someone said, no, no, that was the liver overworking, you know. So it's understanding what different things can do to your body and how they can help. But just because we overdo something doesn't mean you'll heal quicker. You know, it's one step at a time with understanding and guidance. Those are my words as well. <laughs> and the the uh, the health educator program, what was that like? Well, that was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And we were very fortunate those days to have Victorious. I'm not sure if they're doing the programme at the moment, but the people that ran it, every it changed each year with different organisers. And then the, the last many years, it was brilliant. They're not doing, I don't think they're doing it at the moment, but it was a fantastic course. And you did various, it wasn't just 
teaching sprouts. There were different subjects um, and explaining that, I always say the food is a small part of it, but we've got the rest of it. What's going on in here? And I often say to people, why did you get cancer? And they go, it's in the family. And I laugh and go, wrong answer. You don't have to get it and work out why and what's going on. It didn't happen when you, you got diagnosed last week. It didn't happen there and then. It could have been five years, 10 years, 20 years. What are we hanging on to? And we, it doesn't matter what it is, even colds and coughs. Someone says, I had a cold. I've got a cold. How come? Oh, well, I was in a room with a lot of people. <laughs> And uh, as someone knows who I mean by that, um, and I, you know, no, I, I'm in a room with a lot of people many times, but I don't get colds anymore. I haven't had colds for years. If I get one, well, that's my fault uh, from overdoing or whatever. But um, I always say sleep and drinking water is very important. If you don't do those two things, I don't think I can help you. Or at least I can't help them. They have to help themselves. But I'm joking. But then we laugh and then we work out what's important and what's not. And even if they don't learn like water, learn to drink it. I was brought up with water. So it, I've always liked water. It's not been a big problem. Um, but then I wasn't brought up with fizzy drinks at lunchtime. And I never liked Coca-Cola so, or lemonade. So, you know, that wasn't a big issue for us. Or for me, anyway. <laughs> so... Hippocrates is quite well known for having a little bit of a and I mean say anti fruit message, but they don't really serve a lot of fruit there. I don't know what they teach on it. What what's the teaching okay. there? In... Uh, they have fruit twice a week, and as you can imagine, that it's quite a busy table. Uh, but basically, they're not encouraging. Well. If you could have fruit, ripe fruit, as opposed to soft fruit, if that makes sense. So if it was like, I've had figs in Portugal straight from the tree or in Greece. Oh, wow. But when I had figs from the fruit store here in England, I thought it tasted awful. No offense, men, but they have to pick them so far in advance. Mm -hmm. And even in Portugal, they have it brought in from Spain and uh, a lot of their vegetables and fruit. And of course it has to be picked in advance so it can stay on the shelf longer. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in a store there and I look and I think, oh, they look mushy. Oh, they've come from next door. I'm going to buy those. Whereas a lot of foreigners won't, they want it to look perfect. But I want the sweetness of a real fig. But it's, um, what they're trying to say is, you know, we need, if we're going to have fruit, we need ripe fruit from the energy from the sun basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, gaining um, thing but they don't encourage it because it's a lot of sugar and um, they prefer you to eat fruit as opposed to blend it mm -hmm. but then everyone's different you know um, it's not overdoing it but for, they, do, they have fruit on a twice a week Wednesday, uh, Wednesday I think it is and Sunday mornings i think it's really just in case because it's fasting day juice fasting green juice fasting day on a wednesday assuming they're still doing that and uh but there's fruit there in case you don't feel so good or your sugar levels are unbalanced of course suddenly everyone's sugar levels are unbalanced um if you know what i mean i'm being facetious and then um on sunday because it's the weekend you're not doing there's not so many classes and talks and things and more free time so in case they don't feel so good and they haven't drunk their juice um they might feel they need to have some a quick fix of sugar from uh, fruit mm -hmm. a lot of their fruit not all obviously comes from florida because a lot of i mean i've seen boxes come in from other in the in the kitchens and They've probably bought locally from the supplier, but it's come in from Israel or Holland, you right. know. Right. That's what we've been doing too much of around the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that's the way it is. But that, I'm not anti-fruit. I just don't eat a lot of it, but that doesn't mean, you know, when I'm somewhere, I, I love fruit. I mean, I think it's delicious and it's great, but then I also love vegetables too. Uh -huh. And if I get the balance, I'm okay. Uh-huh, uh-huh.
And um, you, you you went on from there to start to help other people out. And is that is that something you're still doing? And what what how have you done that? And well, I was I suppose I was quite fortunate when I started because I was one of the first health educators, I think. Mm -hmm. Because whenever Brian and his wife uh, were in different countries, I made sure I was there. Um, I don't do that so much now, but, well, mind you, we haven't had him here, but um, I don't, there have been many more people trained since then, because it was 1998 when I trained, and um, it seems so long ago. But anyway, it's, um, I was very fortunate to hear a lot of talks, and then I love to present stuff. So, you know, I've got, a, used to have tables of wheatgrass, you name it, they, people knew where to find me. Um, oh, just look for all those. One company used to give me um, used to give me the wheatgrass. I used to take about twenty four trays, being the English size, not the big American size, and uh, they give it to me. And when it was, I used to do a lot of shows. So we used to have the uh, organic food and wine in Bristol. Now that one is about health was about health it was pointed out to me because then I did a vegan one and I said to someone I don't understand it I've normally got three 24 trays at the other at the organic food and wine and I said but I've still got loads left and it's only Saturday evening and this girl said but Jill this isn't about health <laughs> it's about health they know why they're going and I thought what a good point and I wish I could remember who it was. I've had some very good comments from people. It's like talking about fruit. Pick them in, well, they're in season now, but pick, they'll be out of season soon, but they're in season in the winter and our time. And in, um, we, even though oranges are quite acidic, they're delicious when they're yoga teachers training are picking people up from Spain to go to Portugal so we ate these delicious oranges and a couple of months later I was back in England and I thought you know I'll just go to the local store and just get some oranges and I looked at them and I thought oh they're not orange so I said to the guy I'm sorry to say but these are not really orange and he said telling me my family have a plantation in Spain and I have to sell these but that's <laughs> because a lot of the fruit like that comes in and bananas and things come into the country green and they're kept cold storage and then they're gassed before we receive them. This is in the large supermarkets. Second, like they've got a business to run, that's the way it is. But once you've tried something, you know, what I call the real fruit, you know, I, I, I brought lemons back from Portugal in, to a workshop from my friend's house and I've gone, I've got real lemons and someone says, yes, I have those. I said, and they tell me where they bought them at a supermarket. And I go, oh, no, these came from a tree. I'm being facetious, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, as you know, have it straight from the tree when it's ripe or it's fallen to the ground, it becomes real and it's the right shape. It's the shape it should be as opposed to most apples in supermarkets, sadly, will be all the same shape. That's not how it works, really, on a tree. But anyway, there we are. So what would be a typical day for you in terms of your diet? And has it been quite consistent over the years? Has it changed? Do you stick to raw food or how, how does it work for you? I'm not 100% raw, uh, but I'm probably a good 75% plus because I drink my juices and get my protein through that. and. Um, I always say I'm not perfect. I preach a lot and pick some of it up on the way. So some of my customers go, oh, you're a real person. <laughs> and uh, But um, I do my best to have sprouts if I've grown them or I've had deliveries from Aconbury Sprouts. Occasionally when I'm doing an event, I like to use a company as well because otherwise people want them like mine. And I'm not growing to sell as such. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, I like them to see what we've got. Right. 
I mean, if we could have things shipped from other countries, we would, but it's not possible. But, um, and we have a lovely range from Aikenbury Sprouts, and I've used them for years. And um, so I try to eat that and do vegetable soups and things. And yes, I do eat some cooked, not overcooked, but you know, I'm, um, and if I'm out and we're out somewhere, I go with the flow of what's in the restaurant. I don't make it an issue. I've never made it an issue, okay. you know. So, but I'm not, I've never pushed to be a hundred percent raw, but it does make a big difference when you are, you know, even when I'm at Hippocrates there or I've gone to any, um, I've been to one or two others and I make, make the most of it because the buffet's there, go for it. I haven't even had to wash the dish at that time, you know, um, so. No. You, you mentioned doing events and things like that. Is that retreats, classes, and are, are you currently actively still doing that, or what? What is it that you? How, how do you? How are you helping people basically? Well, basically, I do consultations, or I love my workshops, which are get, or classes are going to start up again because with lockdown we couldn't, and there's still a bit of a fear, I think, from some. But I'm getting inquiries now, so I will start those. I've decided once it gets a bit warmer um, and then I'll do them regularly. Um, and I'm doing public events as well. I mean, we've got VegFest coming up. I'm doing that in Brighton. Um, I did it last year. Um, well, I'm doing something else. I'm doing another event, um, but I'll go anywhere that I can go. Uh, and I like to be there and I like to have a table as well, have a stall or something. Because then um, I call it my comfort blanket. I'm behind it, and people come up to talk about what's on the table, you know, and then it becomes a talk um, and things like that. So we've got that. I believe we've got Brian Clement suddenly coming next week, all a bit short notice, apparently. Um, but I've said I'll have a table at one of the events. He's coming to Veg Fest soon. No, no, it's not Veg Fest. He's, I think he's coming. He's coming into somewhere in central London. I think they've organised it because we said it was too short notice, and uh, you know, given a week's notice, you can't. You know, you've got to get people to come. But I think that things are being organised, and I only knew yesterday, so <laughs> um, I'm um, got to get something on my website once I've got the information. Um, but it helps when you meet other people there, or there might be previous clients, previous people, if they've heard about it. Mm -hmm. But that's fine, you know. And then I, I join lots of groups online where it's spreading the word. And I've given a lot of talks online that people have organized for me. Um, uh, we've got... Uh, what have we got? Um, World Vegan Market Online, um, which is organized by someone called Shivari. And she's done brilliantly for the last three years. And uh, we get, she organizes talks with us, and um, which I do from the kitchen and uh, show all my sprouts or put something to show off about. Um, and, um, oh yes, I'm still doing it. I'm not doing so much in Portugal now. Because uh, things have changed. I mean, when I started, vegan restaurant wasn't known. Now there's so many, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was, as I say, I was fortunate to be one of the first. Now I have to think about it again, you know, put it all together. But people are wanting the workshops and there's not so many of that. They're wanting things that are easier. They don't want to make things. So even though we soak and dehydrate nuts and seeds and things like that, you know, there are products out there that are already done. They might not be the cheapest, but, you know, if they want it ready done, there it is. So I'm looking into things like that at the moment for people. Um, so if people want to get in touch with you, how would they, how should they find you or follow you? Well, I'm on, um, uh, I can send you all the information. I'm on, um, have my website, 
I have, though I've got to update it. We've got, um, I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on Facebook. I have two pages on Facebook, but the friends one has more information. Um, just depends what I'm in the mood for sharing. Sometimes it's food, sometimes it's be calm uh, type things. You know, I just, it just depends what goes on. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, my name, I always say, my name is my, they can contact me through my name, Jill Swires. That's my Facebook. Uh, that's my um, website. website, right? JillSwires.com. So it's, uh, even though I'm called Living Foods for Health, I find Jill Swires is easier as long as they remember how to spell it. But it usually comes up. They find me in the end. <laughs> I'm not hidden away that much. So, so. You've, um, you've obviously worked with a lot of people and been at Hippocrates a lot. What would you say are some of the success stories that you've seen? Oh, brilliant success stories. You know, I always say there's no guarantee. Mm -hmm. People don't like that. But, you know, unless you work at it, because there's so many words we can't say. I can't cure them. A doctor can't say that. I can't heal them. And I can't help them. I can guide them. I can make suggestions. They have to help themselves, cure themselves, help them, you know, do all that. And so, uh, but I see people, let's say, at Hippocrates come in. And I will say, I remember one guy from Portugal, actually, from, had MS, many cancer, uh, diabetes, insulin, saw him off insulin in five days. Remember, there's, doc I mean, I'm saying there's doctors there to guide them. Um, there have been wonderful success stories. It doesn't work for anyone, everyone, because not everyone wants to go there. They're pushed there. They're paid for to go there. They... Um, you know, they don't want to change their foods. If they were able to stay longer, maybe that would help. But I think it's, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are all food addicted in our own way, even if we don't want to admit it. But, um, I, I mean, I remember one woman came in and I said she had a long grey plait, uh, didn't look happy, was exhausted you could tell I said you watch her she's going to transform I just knew it but they went oh Jill you don't know what you're talking about this sort of thing I always remember and uh she transformed in three weeks she worked in a prison and um I believe she came back again someone paid for her to go there but she loved it of course the problem is the food at where she works probably isn't uh, doesn't help. But in saying that, she probably learned to understand everything about it. The same with the guy with MS. Yeah. He got it through drugs. And uh, I knew about him more because he was from Portugal and everyone was going, Jojo, there's someone from Portugal. <laughs> and I went away for a few days to help someone in their food restaurant. It was raw. And then um, came back. Jill, Jill, you've got to see him. He, he hasn't got his walker. And da, da, da. It worked beautifully. But it did come back because, of course, he went back to old habits and things. And in the end came back, I think, for six weeks. And he did wonderfully. That doesn't mean it works for everybody. Um, and, of course, then when you get home, I always say, concentrate on the juice don't worry about the rest and they go when i say that there in the talks they they say oh, but he says you've got to do it all i said yes he's right but you'll give up in a week like i did and i was a chef and thought it would be easy and i had some nutrition behind me but that, it didn't i thought oh no it's easier my way so we've all got that problem it's just let's add things and build it up gradually Sure. Even in a workshop, I teach a lot, and they have a full meal while they're there. I prefer two-day ones, but nowadays everyone's too busy. Um, but they get a, a full meal, juicy. They get the full thing, and some, some of them notice a difference. And uh, but when they go home, I say, right, but just concentrate on this and that. And then, if you want to make something, do that. Gradually add it. Gradually, but don't 
you make it too exhausting for yourself because yes you will give up freshly made is always best but you know if you make your juice in the morning for the day or if you make it for two or three days it's better than not at all i'm still alive to tell the tale i keep some in the freezer but that doesn't mean it's healthy but it's better than not at all or if you're going to buy from a, a health food store and there are places that do them that's up to you as well if you can afford to do that regularly so so one step at a time but mm. get the understanding yep excellent so what are your kind of plans for the future and what are you hoping to to do um well, i'd like to believe it or not i'd like to continue with it i did think i wanted a retreat center i think that's what but at the moment i'm I want to get out there more. Um, I'd like to be at the events more. So the more events we get, the better. I attend events anyway, whether I'm speaking or doing it there anyway, so people remember who you are and usually do. Um, and uh, I really like to work with people. I think I did say to somebody, maybe at Hippocrates, was it about to say? Said, oh, I wonder if I should go to so and so or so somewhere. And they said, no, you're better out in the real world working with the people or something like that. Because I can read their minds often, what they're thinking, or, you know, I, I like to put words into their thoughts if I have a gut feeling about something. And that's the way I am. I, that, yeah, I don't know where I'm going to go from now at the moment. I was offered some work or indirectly out in, Sri, uh, not Sri Lanka, um, Costa Rica or somewhere. But I thought I was better off here. But uh, it would be warmer weather. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but, you know, I'm going to give talks at um, someone's got a centre now, but, uh, Nadia Brighton down in wales mm -hmm. quite a long way unfortunately but she's got a center there and i'm going to give a talk down there in july for an event that she's organizing with other herbalists and um we'll just see where it takes us you know yeah brilliant um yeah. what it does as well i think that as you were mentioning the hypocrisy will take in people that have cancer looking to solve that do you, did he see success stories with that oh loads oh loads there's so many success stories and people keep going back because they feel they get the encouragement um but no i've seen it in whereas they they need to i always say people should do the three-week program and um oh well i can only do two weeks i said no if you can do three weeks because then you've got one week to get worse because you have to get worse to get better uh, often and then second week to get over it third week to understand it and appreciate it and there's lectures going on different talks by different people whether it's medical or whether it's um Brian Clement himself or his wife or various other people and um but fantastic success stories it's been amazing I mean we panicked our first week I always remember she had a breast cancer and in the lymph and it got worse and worse. It got bigger, bigger. And it was in the evening and we rang up the person on duty and she said, stop worrying. It's fine. And she came out just to reassure us. And it was down in the week. But it's like anything, it has to, sounds funny, it has to come out to go back in, you know. And of course the body doesn't like even though we should do our breathing practices readily, et cetera, it doesn't really like oxygen because it needs oxygen. So if you give it green stuff or oxygenated foods, I always give the example of a lump. It'll go, ooh, don't like that, and then shrink, yeah. which is a compliment. But then um, give it sugar or too much sugar or sweet things, it loves it and then it can get worse you know we've got to know what we're doing you know and uh no the success stories there really are genuine 
because I've seen it for myself anyway, and in my own group originally. We had people uh, with cancer, awful migraines. Um, I don't know, there, there was a whole list of things. Um, and well, one who had the migraines, I think she had cancer as well. It's uh, She's teaching all the time. Mm -hmm. She's everywhere, loves it. You know, it changed our lives. So, uh, you know. <laughs> It'd be good if you if you can connect us with any if any of those people because we don't get a lot of testimonials of people saying that that they've um, oh. been able to deal with cancer with a raw food diet. Okay, well I'll, I'll I will put you in touch with well the one person what person with the cancer I'll get details to you. We could do that another time. That's okay. Another time, yeah. Yeah, I'll think about that. So, what are some of what are some of the mistakes that you see people make on on the raw food path? Too much sugar, too many raw desserts. Right, right, right. You know, it's it's uh, that's what they'll do. Um, I mean, even people who stay in Hippocrates. Uh, Wednesday is fasting, juice fasting, then you break it with the soup in the evening. And I remember meeting, I was that's when I was working there, and I went, I met a friend for supper somewhere. We walked in somewhere. Oh, there's some of the guests eating a meal there. You know, okay, it was lovely vegan food, don't get me wrong, but mm-hmm. Part of the program is to have that break. That's, that's a, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. And they, I mean, yes, they're taken somewhere usually if they want to at the weekend and different restaurants once a week to, at the weekend. But uh, I don't think they expected to see us walk in. <laughs> sure, sure. But uh, uh, as I say, I believe in certain things they should start with and work with. And if they just do those and don't worry about the rest, it becomes easier and easier. You oh. know, a lot of uh, in London now, and I think most places, the, the best restaurants have gone, the, the, the raw ones and whatever, because they, most people who went to eat there didn't live locally. So during lockdown, the, deliver, they, the Uber deliverers or whatever could only deliver local. Right, right. So if you were somewhere, I mean, I used to take the train over to one, it's gone, uh, the other side of London, and then I I just bought a load of stuff and then rang up a couple of friends and said, right, we can split this order. You know, the raw pizzas, they did beautifully. So I was known for that. Fantastic. For buying them. Yes, I make them, don't worry. But uh, <laughs> they were delicious. <laughs> but they've all gone. Right. Uh, mm. What are, what would be your words of advice or encouragement for those who are starting off? Get advice. Mm -hmm. Get advice from someone that knows, because I think that's very important. Um, even though I was fairly strict with myself, I didn't get advice. So then I'm craving. But it's you know when you give up something. Let's say you're giving up your meat protein or, you know, whether it's fish, whatever meat it is, you've got to replace it. Whatever you give up, you've got to replace. And people go, well, why would I? But you need your protein and protein gives you energy. And, um, you know, I'm full of protein here. <laughs> uh, I lost the sprouts of protein. They're all different levels. Greens are better, but mung beans, for example, you wouldn't grow those green because then it's unbalanced, the original protein that they have. But, you know, there's different ways of doing things. And um, it's, uh, but I always say, if you can get advice, or even when they come to a work workshop, they, they gain more. If they come for a consultation, it's limited in a way. But when you're at a workshop, their question is the one you didn't dare ask. Or, oh, that's the same as me. And then there's a bonding going on, a, a connection, because I think questions are very important. So, yes, 
definitely get advice first, even if they're not planning to do raw. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't matter. They still need advice. I think, yeah, because, you know, you can't just go and buy up everything that's vegan in a packet. That's not going to help. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining me today, Jill. Really well, appreciate you. that. It'd be nice to hear your story and your advice and information. And is there anything final you want to say before I just finish off? Well, to everyone, onwards and upwards, and uh, contact me anytime. And, uh, you know, first call's usually free. And um, let's all stay well and be well. Thank and be you as well. So thank you very much. Thank Good you to meet you online. <laughs> yeah. So thank you everyone for watching and listening on the Love Fruit podcast. And uh, check out Jill Swires, S W Y E R S J I L L for the Jill part of that. You can find her online and on her website. If you'd like to learn more about Raw Vegan Festival in the UK, you can check out fruitfest.co.uk. You can join us at UK Fruit Fest community or Facebook group. And uh, you can join us on Friday nights. We have guests on Friday nights and presentations that are free to join. Uh, you can join us there. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening and watching. We'll see you in another episode of the Love Fruit Podcast.